presentation uh, by Eric Dollard. This is uh, Bach music is obviously uh, one of his greatest passions and he's going to be blending uh, his uh, four phase uh, analysis uh, of the Tesla four phase and uh, the four phase analysis method which he presented on uh, in relation to Tesla's four phase system is going to be used to uh, show a practical uh, example of how to apply the four phase analysis method to a piece of music by Bach. Um, Eric Dollard's organization, EPD Laboratories Inc., is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation. It is a uh, tax deductible um, charitable uh, corporation based out of Nevada, and it uh, survives by uh, donations. Uh, the official website is ericpdollard.com. That website here uh, is missing his middle initial, so don't go there. Uh, somebody stole the website and uh, uh, was using it for fraudulent purposes. It's ericpdollar.com, and on there you can go to forward slash donate or see a donate link in the uh, main menu bar. And you can scroll down and you can find out how to donate by uh, PayPal. 95% uh, of the donations come in that way, or you can send a check or money order to the address in Spokane. I just endorse those and send it down to the bank in Nevada. That pays for everything going on down there, building rent, insurance, you name it, parts, some travel to have like uh, Griffin and uh, Haka says go there and help with different projects and with uh, Justin and doing work out in the field, both out in the field and also in the, uh, uh, in the building. Uh, it'll support projects like, for example, for milliwatts, putting Tesla style ground transmission uh, into the earth. They were able to pick it up uh, 14, 15 miles away or something like that. These are the kind of things that are constantly going on, so all the, all the funding, all the donations are absolutely going to furthering the electrical sciences. And to have uh, Eric uh, heading that up is, uh, couldn't ask for you know, uh, anyone more qualified. Uh, so ericpdollar.com, share it with your friends, let them know. A lot of people are interested in Tesla, but there's a lot of nonsense online on YouTube and Facebook and all that, but you know, this is where you come to, to see the real thing. And so this next presentation is the uh, origins of the musical scale and the four-phase analysis of BWV 536 by J.S. Bach. Help me welcome Eric Dollard. So, so this is basically an extension of my previous presentation, but it's getting into the more of the musical aspect of it. Uh, we need to define what music is or is believed to be. Uh, what I would be presenting on is cannot be considered music in today's standards. So when you go back to Pythagoras and Plato, and even as far ahead as Bach, uh, music wasn't really, in the minds of these people, was not for entertainment value. It was more for a spiritual value or tuning into the, uh, the basic uh, phases of the cosmos, so to speak. Uh, after the death of Bach, it degraded rapidly, and Romanticisms and other isms and ists all entered in, and then it started getting a sick sound to it until today it's generated into uh, what I refer to as hump and slap music. Uh, a friend of mine came up with another term uh, called kick and whip, and then uh, a person I was staying with here some time back, uh, he called it something that I can't say. So, so and, and ex I can give an example of that is, is I've developed a device called the musical television. And uh, when you play this, uh, whatever you want to call these noises are that you hear now, it makes absolutely no image whatsoever. But if I take uh, an orchestral work of Handel, uh, what appears on the screen is absolutely fantastic and it actually has scared some people out of the room, so that means it's on the right track. Now 256 is the Pythagorean center frequency for everything that goes on here and departing from it uh, introduces a frequency error. In this age it would have been in terms, more in terms of wavelength, but uh, it's generally believed, even though there's no absolute proof of it because it's purely uh, subjective, is that there are people that know the right frequency, can experience the right frequency. And I think that's pretty much how these people maneuvered. And the right frequency is not necessarily the same from one day as it is the other. So, so basically, there's a whole modulation going on here. So 
when you're playing the pipe organ, the frequency is dependent on the air temperature, the air humidity, uh, the atmospheric pressure, uh, the temperature of the pipes, all this type of stuff, uh, right down to, you know, the tensions of the planets and gravity. And so what you're dealing with, the, the pipe organ and the church itself represents a transformer, which takes the basic... Uh, cosmic parameters around you and converts them into something that gets into your wavelength. And then, of course, the span of the music is giant wavelengths and small wavelengths, and so you are transformed into this, air, this uh, arena of wavelengths, just like being in the forest where, you know, you got a one-foot-high sprout and you got a 150-foot-high tree. So this is completely foreign to anything that is considered music today. It has no relation whatsoever. In the first frame here, we, sh we have the four something, and uh, and Pythagoras is standing in the background, and all of these uh, metal workers are pounding with hammers. And it turned out to be that that one set of hammers were close to this numerical relationship, and he heard this sound, these sounds, and then he went and explored that. And the next frame shows making bells in that numerical sequence, which is a wavelength number, but then also there's water and glasses. Now it's a frequency number, and it should be remembered that frequency and wavelength are inverse of each other, tied together by the speed of propagation, which in water and air and metal and bells and all of that is, uh, you know, is some kind of variable. Uh, then the next frame down uh, with the wavelength, short flutes, long flutes, but all made in that numerical sequence of 16, 12, 9, 8, 6, and 4. This is the gateway to, to all of the musical uh, scale analysis in the, the musical scale of our culture and also many other cultures. So the first analog computer to work with this was called the monochord, which is a single string half-wave instrument. And you put a, a short circuit or a shunt which they call here a bridge, and then one side of the string will be longer than the other side of the string, and there will be a ratio of those lengths. So this gives us the ratios that we were just talking about. So uh, the, the normal way of presenting this is very confusing. It's kind of backwards, but we got one to one, which is no ratio. It's just one. And then we have our, our fourths and fifths, uh, they're upside down here in this portrayal. The one and two is the octave, so everything here is upside down, but uh, these were the only ones that were available for this presentation, or the presentation that, that I made some time back on this. So these are proportionalities, so one to two, three to two, and four to three. These are the expressions of the ratio. So this gives us our basic coordinate system. This is a, a very, very popular drawing that appears in every book on the subject. So this kind of gives you an idea of the span of what we're dealing with in the position. So I, now if everything works right, we'll see what this sounds like. <laughs> This is the beginning of a musical scale. So each of the, the octave, the root, the fifth and the fourth have coordinate systems, and this expresses those coordinate systems. Uh, it's, it's rather detailed. I don't think in the position I'm in right now I can really get into a lot of analysis of it because I can't see anything here, but uh, I'll try. So the octave... Everything goes up in steps of two, and then, then newer coordinate system starts to emerge as you work your way up the scale. So basically, there is no real zero frequency, so this is kind of an imaginary, and then that sets us there. But we have to move up from four to eight in order to get an octave. That was the 512. This is the 256. 
and then the uh, the uh, 16 one that goes up, that's one that's 1024. And so that gives us these logarithmic operators. So alpha here now is actually a logarithmic operator, just like base E or the golden ratio or any of those things. It's become a logarithmic operator. It's a log base, so to speak. And this is where you start to see that pattern of the black keys on the piano. It's like one group and another group and one group and another group. That's starting to emerge here now. And that will present itself quite clearly later on. So I think this is, uh, okay, so this is what these coordinates sound like. Octave. So Plato starts to build on the Pythagorean uh, number progression, which is over here. Uh, there's really, it's kind of an uh, esoteric subject. Not really a lot of people know about it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, speculation and what have you. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, one of the high authorities on the matter, a person by the name of Godwin, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Godwin, that... Uh, assisted me with getting some absolutely essential material that nobody else has on this stuff. So, so that was helpful. And there's a book called Music of the Spheres and not the one written by Guy Murchie. It's a fraud. It's a physics farce fraud. Uh, it's a Jameson or somebody, Jamie, a name like that wrote it. It's a very well-known, easy-to-find book. And it gave me enough information where I could... I tried... Uh, it was very difficult, and I partially succeeded in deriving the, the Plato, Plato's process to develop the musical scale, which is all basically couched in, uh, in esoteric uh, ancient symbolisms and phrases. And, uh, but the uh, music of the Spheres book was very helpful in that. Now, what's interesting here is we get the real A, the true A that we're supposed to use, and that's 426 and two-thirds. It's not 432, or nor is it 440. His A is supposed to equal 426 and two-thirds because it represents the irrational coordinate system, where 256 and zero-thirds represents the real coordinate system. And that's the way that this music is supposed to work. So the experiment ahead is, is to play the sequences of Bach and see what do they sound like when they're played in this form. It's going to be, um, I'm really kind of looking forward to it, but it's going to be a bit of work, but you can see the build up here. Thank you, Eric Dollard.